Hello, um, this video is to go over um, the questions uh, for your first section test for Philosophy 1100. That was due Monday, uh, October 9th. Um, I'm about to turn to grading these now, and um, generally I give myself about two weeks uh, to turn these grades around, since these, as you now know, are fairly writing-intensive um, assignments. Uh, on my part, they require a lot of um, reading, of course, right? um, but um, thought and reflection with regard to uh, how you've responded and thought and reflection with regard to the clarity of your response as well. So those are generally the categories that I consider uh, as important in grading these. I ask myself first, did, do, did you interpret the theory in sort of a faithful manner? Right. Um, uh, did, did, like, did you get it right? Uh, that's 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 the first thing that I ask myself. And secondly, um, how exhaustively have you treated um, the, 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 the the theory with regard to um, the question that you were directed to answer? Uh, thirdly, um, in terms of writing style, how clearly have you communicated the ideas? Right. If your reader didn't know what the heck you were talking about, uh, would they be able to? figure it out um, from what you've um, offered, and um, it, this is going to sound strange, but how conceptually nimble are you? Um, these questions ask you to, in some cases, analyze, uh, in other cases, distinguish, and um, in still other cases, offer critical assessment. So basically, what I'm asking myself is, how conceptually nimble you are, that is, um, how, how able are you to handle and work with these ideas, right? So um, your grade out of five points is going to be assessed by those following criteria. And um, you'll see the extensive comments that um, I'm going to offer on these assignments, which is part of what takes me so much time to grade them, um, will address um, any shortcomings. And uh, they're designed to be therapeutic, to help you do better on the next section test, right? You did really well here but you might concentrate on um, clarifying your response. It may seem obvious. To a certain extent, um, I'm fond of pointing out that philosophy in terms of arguments is a lot like math. It's not just a matter of getting to the right answer or the right conclusion. You've got to kind of show your work as well, how you've arrived at this, right? So it's a demonstration of your ability to reason, um, analyze and critique um, it, it, these positions as, as, as they're presented by the theorists that we're engaging in. So, um, <clears throat> and again, I'm not trying to be a jerk. This has to be a writing intensive course and um, it's designed, right, as the syllabus suggests, to, um, to enhance your skill at like communicating clearly and effectively um, using uh, your faculty of reason to critically assess and analyze um, these various theories as um, they're presented throughout the history of Western philosophy. So, um, again, section test one, it's out of a total of 30 points, five points for each question. Um, it's worth 30% of your final grade as well. So, um, that's what we are looking at here. Um, and uh, before I even jump into the material, I should point out that I'm not perfect. Sometimes I get things wrong. Sometimes when it's I've got about a hundred of these to get through, um, sometimes your eyes just go buggy and I might not have given you credit for something that was there. So if you've got questions or concerns about the way that you were assessed, please contact me and um, I will either offer more clarification or in a case where I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Right? And um, if you present me with a good argument for why your grade should be changed, I'll change it. That's, that's, um, that's basically what it is. Um, so, uh, it, it, the readings um, and uh, the video material were identified on the test. Um, you're responsible for that, and to a certain extent, if there's something relevant from that material to answering the question, I expect you to be sort of juggling all of these ideas, explanations, interpretations, and concepts. So, um, uh, this is, uh, it, and you'll find a number of these questions. There are a variety of ways that you can rise to the challenge of um, answering them completely. 
Um, so short answer questions, um, it's a, it basically what I'm looking for is um, do, 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 uh, do, 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 substantial responses in paragraph form to these, right? So question one read, um, in the early part of Socrates' trial defense, he relates a story of how he became known as the wisest man in Athens. This story introduces an epistemological position wherein human wisdom is worth little or nothing. That's from page 27 of your five dialogues. But on the basis of this epistemological claim, he's still able to ground positive ethical claims. Discuss this transition from epistemology to ethics. Now, um, it, it, I, I, in the very introductory video on the pre-Socratics, um, introduced the, the, the three spheres, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Um, so I consider that background to this question, and while well, introducing Socrates, I made that distinction between his epistemology, or theory of knowledge, and his ethics, which is a theory of action. Right? So, Epistemologically, he's the wisest man in Athens. Why? Because he alone knows that he knows nothing. If I were answering this question, I would have started with that story. And he tested his wisdom going to the various classes of citizen or stranger that he encountered in the Agora. Right? The, the politicians and moral leaders, um, the, the, the poets and writers of prose, and then finally the craftsmen. Um, and in each and every case, he found that uh, these people were claiming to know something that they didn't know. That is, it, they had beliefs, but they could not offer an account, support those beliefs with reasons. Right? Now, he generalizes this to um, a statement about the status of human beings epistemologically. Um, where he points out that um, in his conclusion of that investigation on um, page 27, and I, it, you know, this is this is an important argument, so it might be important to bring it up in your response. Um, 27. Wait just a second here. Um, what is probable, gentlemen, is in fact that God is wise, and His auricular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. And when he says, this man Socrates, he's using my name as an example, as if he said, this man among you mortals is wisest, who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. That's the epistemology, right? More or less. He generalizes that human beings have belief, but not knowledge, right? The closest to knowledge we ever get is a reasoned belief, a belief that's supported by reasons that should be debated critically in a public setting. Right? So, how do we transition from this epistemological position to a positive ethics, which he does? Well, the next sentence after that, which I just read. So even now I continue this investigation as the god bade me and I go around seeking any one citizen or stranger who might think wise. Then, if I do not think he is, I come to the assistance of the god and show him that he's not wise. You see, what this is, is Socrates demonstrating a disposition towards knowledge. I'm giving you more than you needed to um, in terms of a response to this question, but remember those sophists that I was talking about in the pre-Socratics video, the general introduction in pre-Socratics video, who um, started from the same position as Socrates. Well, maybe we cannot know the big T truth. Maybe knowledge is impossible and the best we ever have is belief. Well, rather than developing an ethics, what they really were doing is developing a theory of power, right? We use argument and reason persuasively in order to get what we want, whether that's money, that's power, whether it's it, it, what have you, right? So Socrates, unlike these people, has it, you know, agreed that maybe the best we can come to is still pretty shoddy when evaluated in terms of the standards of knowledge. We can offer an account, yes, but is that account final or definitive? No. Mm -hmm. Well, this then suggests, if we give a damn about truth, right, that we 
dispose ourselves to this knowledge in such a way as to demand of ourselves and others that we be critical and evaluate our beliefs and presuppositions. Right? So if I hear you claiming to know, well, I know all about that. Oh, really? I'll become your student. Explain it to me, and then if you can't, I'm going to point out it's not knowledge. Right? If you're acting like you know, right? I'm in a position justified on the basis of this epistemology to leap to action. That is, an ethical disposition and an ethical set of actions, right? This is his ethics. You should do this. It's a prescription, right? You should then demand if you hear somebody claiming to know or acting like they know, right? Demand to see their reasons. Show me your reasons. Right? You should do this introspectively as well with regard to your own beliefs, opinions, and actions. And so this becomes, oddly, a positive ethic on the basis of this notion that we don't know. And Roderick, in his video about Socrates and the Examined Life, um, describes this, and this is another resource you had for answering this question, um, describes this as having a belief that you believe with conviction, yet having a meta or after a further belief about the status of that belief that you could be wrong, right? And what's more, you can apply this to other people's belief, right? That they, they, they hold a belief with conviction, but should be persuaded by reasons. So in this manner, Socrates stresses moral reasoning, right? Um, it, this is a slippery argument. It, I'm, I'm, I, I, I completely understand that. Basically, what I'm asking myself is here, have you distinguished between epistemology and ethics and actually managed to describe in some fashion or another that transition from what we know to what we should do? Right? Um, and again, it's going to be, one, have you interpreted faithfully? Two, um, have you answered the question completely? Right? Um, what I find frequently while grading these is that people talk about the epistemology but don't make the leap to ethics, right? So that, that if, if that occurs, that'll receive partial grades. Um, like I say, if I were answering this question, I would break it down into parts, right? Epistemology, ethics, treat them completely. So in this case, it probably required a couple of paragraphs. Right? All right, so that's the first question. The second question. Socrates, on page 35 of the Five Dialogues, presents an argument where he compares himself to a gadfly. In what respect is he like a gadfly? And why is this important by his argument to the city-states of his state of Athens? Outlining the uh, argument for the de de democracy that we discussed, how does the gadfly argument support a case for the protected rights of freedom of speech, and by extension in our modern political context, freedom of the press. This is an important question these days. Right? Um, your first task was to unpack a metaphor. And so we know that Socrates is the gadfly and the city-state of Athens is the great noble steed. But we've got to unpack that. What, what does he mean by that? Right? In what respect is Socrates like a gadfly? Well, he's annoying, and he's a pest, and he stings the horse. Well, in what respect is he annoying? Well, he demands reasons in terms of justification for beliefs. Right? And he points it out when people have bare belief that they're treating as knowledge. Right? So how does he sting the noble steed of, of, of the city-state of Athens? bite it on the butt, and shocking it to alertness? Well, by demanding these reasons in the way of justification, and as he argues, making sure people think and about and value the right sorts of things, what he's doing is demanding of the whole city-state that it become alert about the values that underpin its behavior in the world and inform our votes. Remember, as Roderick points out, right, a polis, 
right? A city state, especially a democratic one, is where we should observe no force save for that peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. Right? A democracy is a place where we both rule and are ruled. Right? So effectively, right, for our votes to count, we have to engage in this public sort of reasoning and debate by Socrates' argument. Right. So um, we've unpacked the metaphor, outlining the argument for democracy that we discussed, and this was in that video, um, my Socrates' apology video, um, it, where I pointed out that democracy is something you have to argue to rather than from, right, as following Socrates' argument. Right. He argues that, well, a democracy is one of the best ways to go because it actually relies upon the expression of that which is most noble in human beings, this, this reasoning and public dialogue about values, right? A democracy cannot achieve its own ends without that sort of activity. And because a democracy depends on the expression of that which is most noble, it's probably the best system for governing human beings who want to express that nobility. It's the most human of the political systems. Right? So that's how you outline that argument for democracy. How does the gadfly's uh, argument support a case for the pro protected rights of freedom of speech and freedom, by extension, free, freedom in the modern political context, freedom of the press? Well, a democracy celebrates that which is most noble in human beings, the expression of this public sort of reasoning and dialogue and debate. Right? If a democracy relies on this, a democracy cannot achieve its own ends if there is not a public space in which to actually engage in these public debates. And in a democracy of one, we're respecting that which is most noble in human beings, Right, that which justifies their ability be, to be considered citizens. And secondly, if a democracy cannot achieve its own ends without this sort of activity, then that suggests a case for protected space, legally and politically, for this sort of activity. This is where your First Amendment comes from. We need freedom of speech, and by extension, we need to be able to publicly and in our context that's in, in the media and in the social media, the ability to actually have these arguments. Note that this is essentially what's being denied of Socrates. Right? He's being sentenced to die because he made annoying arguments in a public space that embarrassed the people with the power in the city-state of Athens. Right? And this is how he became the first, the, wor uh, the Western world's first intellectual martyr. Right? So um, it, it's, I, I think it's especially important to understand um, this, this argument. So two parts, basically. Right? Um, one has to do with unpacking the metaphor. You know, that, that, gets, that has some value. Um, and then on top of that, in the context of a democracy, how does this argument um, support a case for freedom of speech and freedom of the press? Right? So basically what I want you to do is take that metaphor that Socrates gave you, connect it to a notion of a robust democracy, and make a case for specific pol political protected rights, right? important ones in our modern political context. Right? So again, um, did you interpret it well, right? uh, and faithfully? Two, if you answered it completely, and three, have you clearly communicated the ideas, concepts, distinctions, and connections right, that were at work in that argument? Um, if, I, I should pause to note here, if you think any of these arguments are bull or problematic in any way, um, a good way to engage with these questions is to offer critique of these positions. Right? So, um, it, you know, it's, it, there's value that I, I, I acknowledge for that sort of activity as well. Right?
Okay, last Socrates question. In his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates in introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Briefly outline this argument, right? uh, the, the one with the fictional conversation with the laws of uh, Athens, defining each of these distinct notions. All right, so that's part one. Right. The laws of Athens say, Socrates, what are you doing? Are you trying to destroy us through your activities? Or do you think that a city-state can exist if private citizens take it upon themselves to overturn their laws? Right. What are you doing, right? What was the agreement between us? Was it that? So and what I wanted in terms of the agreement right, was the idea that, um, you know, you've got three options in the context of a democracy. You don't like the way the laws are. Uh, one, you can take your stuff and go. Two, you can persuade the laws to do better, to be more just. And three, right, this is under the social contract, right, um, it, you can obey the law. You're expected to either obey, to pick your stuff up and go, or to persuade the laws to be more just, right? These are the provisos. Either you obey the laws and get all of the other stuff that you get as a result of existing within the context of a city-state, like, you know, protections from enemies abroad, um, protections from harm from your fellow citizens, structures of commerce, structures of education, etc., to access to, to the basic needs and necessities of life, legal protections for marriage, etc., um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera, and all of these things for your children and your children's children and all of that, right? Uh, ownership of property, etc., right? All of these things are part and parcel with that formal agreement between citizen and state, which is a social contract. Now, Socrates might say, but wait, where did I sign such a, a, a contract? I didn't sign explicitly, show me my signature. No, but Socrates, you were in Athens for 70 years. You were born, you were educated, you lived your life, you publicly argued that Athens was the best dang city state out there. Though you mentioned others that also had just laws. Um, on top of that, you got married, you had kids, and raised them within the context of Athens. He's sort of a weird duck. He also never even traveled for a festival or a vacation, right? He stayed within the walls of the city, state of Athens, only leaving for military service. If you look at his actions, from his actions, was there any indication that he was in any way displeased by the laws of the city, state of Athens? Uh, you can ask yourself those questions, right? Did he pick his stuff up and go? No. Did he show up at the courts and argue that the laws were unjust? No. So, now he has to obey. But where did he give his consent to the social contract? Every day he remained there and remained silent in the face of laws that were producing sort of unjust verdicts. Okay. All right. That's the social contract and tacit consent. And the social contract is the agreement. Tacit consent is the way that he agreed to the agreement. Right. Part two of the question. By your analysis, you see you've got to analyze, of this argument, what sorts of duties are implicit to democratic citizenship? I'm often fond of saying that the credo is about duties because to a certain extent it shows a failing of Socrates. He didn't show up and argue in the court. He complained the day of his trial that well, it's one day is pretty quick. This trial is pretty quick when somebody's arguing for their lives. Right? If he had more time, maybe he'd be able to convince more of the judges. But since this is our law, this is what he's got to do. Right? So effectively, what Socrates was, was silent in the face of laws that were meeting out injustice. So rather than showing up, he's given himself but the one option obey. Right? So if we're silent in the face of laws that are unjust in the context of a democracy, we are giving our consent to them. So 
based on the ethics that we saw from Socrates, right? What analogously, right? What do we do with somebody who thinks they're just when they are not? Well, the same point, right? We've got a duty to dispose ourselves to these people in a way that demands reasons in terms of justification. We, we've got a duty to argue this, right, in the context of a, a democracy. If the laws that apply to all of us are unjust, it's our duty to challenge those laws. Right? Now, you might think that's bull, and that's fine. I don't need you to agree with it. You can offer critiques as we go along, but um, it, nonetheless, I need you to see the mechanics of that argument. So again, right, did you get it right? Do you see the, the way the parts of this argument work together? Right? Two, have you offered a clear account of the mechanics of this argument? Right? And three, um, have you done it all, right? And four, how nimble are you with regard to your handling of these concepts? Uh, and are you insightful? Are you critical? Are you et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Right? So those are the standards you're being held to. Now, we're on to Plato, and I'm noticing this video is going on. Um, so I think that that little breakdown of the grade, I'm going to drop that as we go on um, and speed things up. Um, a bit. Right? Question 4 on Plato and the Phaedrus. These are all Socrates' second speech co uh, questions here. Um, briefly discuss the constitution of the soul. Quote, what we must say about its structure, that's page 30, offered by Plato in Socrates' second speech. Right? So, remember in, in my video I gave you that funky little pie chart right? where we are that rational self-control and desire and that's what I'm looking for all right the three parts he argues that the soul is tripartite that's its structure um, another way to go about getting this structure is to follow the myth of the chariot here right? Uh, wherein he likens to the soul, um, the soul to a chariot driver and a pair of winged horses. Right? You've got one horse which is big and gnarly and um, doesn't listen to the chariot here. You've got another horse that's noble and of good stock and does what it's told by the chariot here, and then you've got a chariot here. Right? Now it's important to note that this is not like an angel and a devil on either shoulder, right? Because in which case the the chariot driver would be listening to a horse. We don't want to, the chariot driver should be in control. Plato's whole point is that reason should be in control of the passions, the passions to do what is right, and the passions that want what they want when they want it. Right? So, that's your first part, and you break the soul down into its various parts. Now, discuss how Plato's description of the constitution of the soul might uh, ex uh, expand what I call the moral psychology of Socrates, introduced by our discussion of the Apology. Um, when I was introducing the moral psychology, and this is back in the um, Socrates Apology um, video, as I indicated there in our discussion of the Apology, um, there are these Socratic dicta, knowledge is virtue, those that know the good do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. This came out in his defense of himself while he was um, accused of corrupting the youth. Uh, it's, do you accuse me of doing this deliberately or unwillingly? I introduced it there. Right. So, um, effectively, right, uh, what Socrates argued is that nobody does evil intentionally, deliberately, largely it's, a, largely it's always a result of ignorance. Right? The only reason anybody does nasty, foolish, stupid, hurtful, jerky kind of things is because they don't know any better. Now, this should stick in your craw a little bit, because it's a weird expression, but I just used it, so let's go with it a little bit, because um, we, what we're talking about in terms of Socrates is a situation where, you know, it's impossible by his moral psychology that somebody can know what they are about to do is wrong, but they bloody well go ahead and do it anyway. 
Right? Now, there is sort of a simple answer to this question by actually creating a friction between these two different passions that it's reason's job to actually sort out. Right? What Socrates, or what Plato does in um, his treatment of the constitution of the soul is show that, you know, intellectually and morally we can know the right thing to do, but still, you know, the passions are overcome by the desires, right? Go to page 18 uh, for his definition of eros, which he defines akin to other sorts of hubris, right, when it comes to passion for the drink or passion for food. I mean, gluttony and alcoholism are good examples of where desire overpowers a person's better impulse. Eros is another good example, right, where your desire for sex overcomes your better angels. Right? So, right, what Plato has added by the interpretation that I gave you right, is a sort of internal tension, a sort of duality to the human soul, wherein we can know the good, yet still be overcome by desire. Right? And not do it. Right? That's, that's something that Plato refines uh, from Socrates. Right? So that's the idea um, that uh, I was going for there um, and hoping that you would pick up. I gave you a lot of background on the uh, test one video. Um, that's why these videos are important um, to answering these questions. Question five. One of the chief elements of Plato's defense of love is that it brings us uh, closer to knowledge of the perfect truth of the forms briefly introduce Plato's theory of, um, theory of the forms and theory of recollection, right? And then answer this question, how does the special character of beauty serve to justify platonic love in the context of this argument? Okay, so basically what you're trying to say is that these are the forms. The forms or ideas are abstract, general, universal, perfect, unchanging knowledge that is radically distinct from the various particular things that we come across through experience, right? They're immaterial, whereas material things are always imperfect, right? Um, so, given that, we get to the forms by thinking, not by experiencing, right? So, Plato in terms of his epistemology, comes up with this theory of recollection. These things are perfect and we never come across them in experience, yet we use them. We couldn't open a door or recognize a chair to sit in without some sort of abstract knowledge, right, of these forms, right? He points out that we're able to use language because we have some sort of rudimentary education in terms of the general forms, right? I can say cat and you know what I'm talking about. I can say coffee cup and you know what I'm talking about because you have an abstract notion. You don't know if it's dark roast or medium roast or espresso or something along those lines, but I say coffee and you can access the general category. You understand abstractly what the heck I'm talking about. I say triangle, you do the same thing. Right? We do therefore have some access to these forms, yet nothing in experience can actually cause our understanding of these forms because everything we come across is particular. So where does this knowledge come from? From before. Yeah, it's his epistemology, right? We recall uh, what we learned before we were born, right? That means knowledge is innate, right? We're born with it kind of thing. So all learning is recollection by this argument. So what do we do when we try to come to an understanding of the forms in our walk-a-day, work-a-day kind of life, right? We see a cat, we ask ourselves on the basis of this particular thing that we understand as a cat, in what respect? What is it that makes this cat a cat, right? So we abstract from the particular to the universal, right? Thereby recalling that which is essential to the thing, right? That which is the form of the particular thing. This is largely the work of reason without experience chiming in. 
second part of the question. How does the special character of beauty serve to um, justify platonic love in the context of this argument? Remember, that's it, basically Plato's arguing that love is a fourth kind of madness that's not good, or not bad, rather, excuse me, not bad, rather, but actually beneficial. He laid out the three others, right? The poetic, the cathartic, and uh, the prophetic kinds of madness. Right? These are good kinds of madness. It's good that we're inspired. It's good that we can blow off steam. It's good that, you know, we listen to our intuition when and, and it's beneficial to do so. Right? You ever just get a bad feeling on a date or something like that? Well, listen to that. Listen to that. Right? It's beneficial. Right? Well, platonic love, the, the kind of love that Plato is arguing for is beneficial in this respect, right? It, because it, to a certain extent, it, beauty is a special kind of form. Let me see. I want to say it's on page 39. Let's see if my memory is, yes, page 39. Um, do, 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 right by 250D. Uh, now, beauty, as I said, was radiant among the other objects, and now that we've come down here, we grasp it sparkling through the clearest of our senses. Vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily senses, although it does not see wisdom. It would awaken a terribly powerful love. If an image of wisdom came through our, uh, through our sight as clearly as beauty does, and the same for the other objects of inspired love, like justice and that sort of thing. But now beauty had, alone has this privilege to be most clearly visible and most loved. Beauty is the form we can actually, imperfectly, kind of, sort of, but still we can actually bloody well see it, right? And it you know, thereby becomes the best sort of clue for the epistemological exercise of recollecting the perfect forms of the truth that we can possibly have. Right? Remember what Lysias was arguing and Socrates was sort of mock arguing in his first speech is that we should avoid desire and become pragmatic about you know, using reason and self-control, keep our, our wits about us in a relationship, right? Um, it, it, so avoiding desire, which directs itself towards beauty altogether, right? That doesn't do anything for this whole, right? Effectively, right, what Plato is suggesting is that right built into us, we have this aspect of ourselves that's directed to and gets so crazy because it's the desire for the form that we can see. And so, platonic love is good epistemologically. Now, finally, a bonus element of Plato's metaphysics theory of the forms, theory of the soul, and epistemology's theory of recollection is that it serves to um, resolve the contradiction between Heraclitus and Parmenides, discussed in the general introduction and pre-Socratics video. Briefly discuss how these elements of Plato's position accomplish this. Well, recall Heraclitus, the, uh, the empiricist, um, looked at the world and extracted the simple principle to explain all phenomena and how they present themselves to us. Change, multiplicity, flux. You can't step into the same river twice, right? Um, yet, we come to a certain understanding that maps this change by extracting, you know, general principles using reason and language, logos, uh, that explain how to map the change. Right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What goes up must come down, etc., etc., etc. Right? So reason and language come up with meta principles that explain why phenomena move and interact the way that they do. This is abstraction. Right? So pretty good there. But Parmenides comes along and points out that non-being is not an explanatory concept, and it's right at the heart heart of change, multiplicity, and flux. How something becomes what it's not, right? And like, for example, snapping a piece of chalk. This is a piece of chalk. Snap. No longer a piece of chalk, right? Well, you have to invoke non-being as your explanatory concept, right? 
So, by Parmenides' position, there's no change, no multiplicity, no flux, and all things are one. It seems like a contradiction, but in terms of Plato's philosophy, with regard to the world of appearances, right, the particular things made out of matter that we encounter down here, yes, things come into being and pass away, things are in a constant state of change and flux and that sort of thing, there's multiplicity, there are all these cats that are somehow abstractly explained under the, 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 the logos sort of notion of what a cat is, right? So that far, Heraclitus is right. Parmenides, on the other hand, gets to be right from the perspective of uh, the world of being, the world of the forms, that which really is. Right? So, to a certain extent, what, what, what Plato is arguing here is that Parmenides gets to be right as well. Because in the world of the forms, how many cats are there? There is but one form of cat. Is it subject to change? No. There is no multiplicity because there is only the one form of it. And so nothing is in a state of flux from the perspective of being. Right? It's only down here in uh, the world of appearances, right, that things are in a state of change. So what's our job? To recall that which really is, developing our mental acuity, right, the faculties of reason and language, which, as Plato points out, on, I want to say it's page 38, all right, do, 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 do. No, it's not, but somewhere here, um, it, yeah, oh, here it is, page 36, I was close. But a soul that never saw the truth cannot take human shape, since a human being must understand speech in terms of the general for forms, proceeding to bring many perceptions together into a reasoned unity. This process is uh, the recollection of those things our soul saw when it was traveling with God, but when it, uh, it disregarded these things, we now call real and lifted up its head to what is truly real instead. Right? So, effectively, right, since we use speech, reason, and language combined, we're already engaged in this process of recalling what really is. Right? So Heraclitus is concerned with Planning how we get from the world of appearances up to some sort of an abstract knowledge. Parmenides is explaining the nature of this abstract knowledge. So Parmenides is right, Heraclitus is right, and there is no contradiction between the two. Right? I, I have to admit that's a complicated question, but I think it's an important one for us to understand if we want to understand the way that these arguments work. Um, that also explains why Plato's metaphysics and epistemology are laid out the way that they are, right? So, um, five points. Um, did, did you get it right? right. Have you answered completely? Um, and uh, how clear and nimble were you? Right. So, generally, um, you will receive a grade out of 30 points. Um, closing thoughts here, um, I generally expect students to get better at taking these tests as time goes on. So um, it's, if you're not satisfied with your grade on the first, my comments, and I'm available to talk to you about strategies for approaching these questions and these tests as well, um, it, you know, it's, it, the task becomes become better at doing it, right? I'll help you and I'll coach you. Right, um, in order to do that, right? Um, first, by issuing comments and a grade on this one, and I'm not trying to be punitive, I'm trying to, um, as Plato and his theory of education would point, sort of draw it out of you, right? If Plato's right, you all kind of already know this stuff. General principle in a, in a philosophy course is that I'm not going to say anything you've never thought about before. All I'm going to do is go through arguments with regard to these sort of human things that we consider. So in this respect, we're all always already philosophers, right? We're just refining our abil ability, our skills right? at getting at this understanding in a clear and um, sort of public kind of way. Right? 
Alrighty, um, if you have questions, please contact me and uh, have good days, one for each of you.